The United States declared the first Gulf War in 1990, but its involvement in Iraq goes back much further. This is an almost 60-year history of covert and overt intervention. The US would first help to install Saddam Hussein, then support him in a prolonged war with Iran, arming him with chemical weapons. Then they'd go on to declare war on him while still keeping him in power and imposing sanctions that would kill hundreds and thousands of innocent Iraqis. Later, a second war with Saddam, this time under the false pretext of weapons that he didn't have. The result was a mix of destruction and sectarian violence that would see Iraq descend into chaos, civil war, and ultimately lead to the birth of ISIS. Now, 62 years since its first intervention in Iraq, the US still has troops there. In 1958, Iraq was ruled by the British-backed monarch Al-Malik Faisal Athani. Iraq was rich in oil, and the British were freely exploiting this natural resource. Abdul Karim Qasim, an Iraqi army brigadier, launched a coup to seize military control of Baghdad and overthrow the monarchy. The latest Middle East crisis, perhaps the most menacing of all, has flared up in Iraq, a country that produces over 30 million tons of oil a year. The wealth from the country's oil was used to good purpose, so the news of the revolt in Iraq was all the more startling. Qasim was specifically opposed to Western powers controlling Iraq and its resources. Iraq was now a republic with a revolutionary council that had Sunni, Shia, and Kurdish representatives, and a cabinet that included the secular-leaning Ba'ath Party as well as Marxists. Qasim concentrated on women's rights, improving national education, and distributing wealth to the rural poor. Western powers panicked. Qasim was highly critical of the British-owned Iraq Petroleum Company and clearly wanted to nationalize oil production. He also began normalizing relations with Russia. In 1959, Iraq officially withdrew from the anti-Soviet regional alliance known as the Baghdad Pact. President Eisenhower established a special committee on Iraq to monitor events and propose various contingencies for preventing a potential communist takeover of the country. In 1962, President Kennedy gave the CIA instructions to prepare for a coup against Qasim, earning his administration's support to the anti-communist Ba'ath Party. In 1963, the Ba'ath Party staged a coup just five years after Qasim came to power. He was executed live on radio. Ali Saleh Saadi, the Minister of the Interior of the regime that replaced Qasim, famously said, we came to power on a CIA train. Within the Ba'ath Party, a former enforcer named Saddam Hussein was rising to power. The CIA continued its support, using information from Iraqis in exile to assist in the targeted assassination of communists, dissidents, and Qasim loyalists. The Iranian Revolution saw the overthrow of the pro-Western Shah and the transformation of Iran into an anti-Western theocracy. The new Iranian regime was opposed to Saddam's rule and worried that this would inspire a Shia uprising in Iraq. Iraq began what would become the Iran-Iraq War. The Reagan administration armed both sides in its effort to ensure that neither side would dominate the region, but ultimately preferred Iraq, supplying it with the weapons and intelligence support needed to win, as Saddam's victory was seen as preferable to that of a rising Iran. By the early 80s, the US was so keen on its support for Saddam Hussein as a means of keeping Iran in check that Ronald Reagan sent Donald Rumsfeld as a special envoy to Iraq twice. Rumsfeld knew that Iraq had committed war crimes with chemical weapons and equipment provided by the US, but said nothing. He would be confronted with this almost 20 years later in a live television interview. That meeting, tell me what was going on during this, uh, this Where meeting. Where did you get this video? From so, the Iraqi television? This is from Iraqi television. When did they give it to you? Recently well, or back then? We've dug this out of the CNN library. I see. Isn't so, that interesting? There I am. So what, were you, what was going on here? What were you thinking at the time? You were pressed during the uh, briefings, uh, during the hearings this week by Senator Byrd on the question of whether the U.S. in any way aided Saddam Hussein in his chemical weapons program. At the time, during the hearings, you said you had no knowledge of it. Have you looked into it since then? Uh, I, I had no knowledge. I have no knowledge today. I also, I think, advised him, but I thought it was most unfortunate that even the implication of that would be raised simply because of some article that somebody wrote. Reagan's Vice President, George Bush Sr., chaired the newly formed National Security Planning Group. Despite their support for Iraq, the U.S. was concerned that the Iran-Iraq conflict would spill over into other regions of the Middle East. Iraq would still be central to the U.S.'s shifting Middle East strategy, but now in a completely different and devastating way. Despite having knowledge of Saddam Hussein's plans to invade Kuwait, the U.S. did not make any attempt to stop him from doing so. This conflict started August 2nd, when the dictator of Iraq invaded a small and helpless neighbor. Kuwait, a member of the Arab League and a member of the United Nations, was crushed, its people brutalized. 
The first Gulf War began with an extensive aerial bombing campaign, described as one of the most intensive air bombardments in military history. The coalition dropped an estimated 88,500 tons of explosives, which decimated both military and civilian infrastructure. But the US did not ultimately attempt to overthrow Saddam, as during the Iran-Iraq War, his presence was seen as preferable to the potential rise of other unknown powers. George Bush's Secretary of Defense at the time was none other than Dick Cheney. Do you think that the U.S. or U.N. forces should have moved into Baghdad? No. Why not? Because if we'd gone to Baghdad, we would have been all alone. There wouldn't have been anybody else with us. It would have been a U.S. occupation of Iraq. Uh, once you got to Iraq and took it over and took down Saddam Hussein's government, then what are you going to put in its place? It's a, it's a quagmire if you go that far. As Commander-in-Chief, I can report to you our armed forces fought with honor and valor. And as president, I can report to the nation, aggression is defeated, the war is over. After his election in 1992, Bill Clinton oversaw the longest U.S. bombing campaign since Vietnam, including major missile strikes in 1993, 1996, and 1998. The Clinton administration also maintained its support for crippling UN sanctions on Iraq, despite no proof that they had any effect on Saddam Hussein's regime. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. The Project for a New American Century, a neoliberal think tank, was founded with the purpose of pushing for aggressive U.S. foreign policy. Ten of the organization's 25 founders would go on to serve under George W. Bush, including Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, and Paul Wolfowitz. In 1998, they began criticizing Clinton's bombings as inadequate and openly advocated for regime change in Iraq. Clinton soon signed the Iraq Liberation Act, which would later be cited to advocate for the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Immediately following the 9-11 attacks in 2001, Right-wing voices like the Project for a New American Century began calling even more vocally for regime change in Iraq. Dick Cheney, now the U.S. Vice President, claimed that Saddam Hussein was stockpiling weapons of mass destruction, a claim backed by American intelligence officials and repeated by media outlets, but which would later be proven false. Bush now pushed for war authorization. This would give him freedom to use military force. Joe Biden was a senior Democrat at the time and the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He supported Bush's administration, coordinating with them to organize a series of Senate hearings to make the case for war authorization. On October 11, 2002, the Authorization for Use of Military Force Against Iraq Resolution was passed by a Democrat-controlled Senate, 77 to 23. 29 Democrats voted in support, including Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. Despite worldwide protests, Operation Shock and Awe began in March 2003. The invasion of Iraq caused mass casualties, untold damage to civilian infrastructure, involved the use of private security firms like Blackwater, and the use of torture against detainees held without trial in military prisons such as Abu Ghraib. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. As the U.S. oversaw the administration of post-war Iraq, multi-million dollar reconstruction contracts were handed out to U.S. corporations like Halliburton. In a process known as debathification, almost 250,000 Iraqi troops were made jobless overnight, told they could not be employed due to their previous loyalty to Saddam's regime. What followed was years of sectarian and religious violence, until many former enemies began to join forces with a singular goal to remove the U.S. occupiers from Iraq. This would culminate in a toxic marriage between religious extremists and secular Ba'athists who were former officers under Saddam. Together, they would found Daesh, also known as ISIS. In 2011, Barack Obama officially withdrew U.S. troops from Iraq after almost nine years. But by 2014, ISIS controlled a third of the country with the help of foreign fighters, and Obama sent 5,000 troops back to Iraq. Donald Trump ran on a platform where he appeared to be against the Iraq war. You, want, you call it whatever you want. I want to tell you, they lied. Okay. They said there were weapons of mass destruction. There were none, and they knew there were none. There were no weapons of mass right. destruction. Okay. But before long, he was also bombing Iraq, this time ordering strikes against Iranian-backed militias and the assassination of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani in Baghdad. Iraq today is witnessing one of its longest periods of public protest in decades. The movement is calling for an end to the political system that has existed in Iraq since the removal of Saddam Hussein. 
Iraqis have taken to the streets over corruption, unemployment, and inefficient public services. This country was once home to world-renowned universities, a hub of arts and culture. But decades of being a geopolitical pawn have left its institutions and people devastated. What the future holds, only time will tell.